Hey everybody, welcome back to Whiteboard Finance. My name is Marco and I'm here to help you master your money and build your wealth. In today's video, I wanted to talk about a topic that's been going on in the news lately, um, whether you follow economic news or political news, um, I'm sure you've heard about the debt ceiling. So I wanted to make a video about this because I was actually going to buy another tranche of T-bills uh, and believe it or not, the four week T-bill, so basically one month T-bills are just under 6% at the time of this recording. Uh, the last auction was like 5.96 or something like that. Um, and it's absolutely blowing the uh, longer duration T-bills out of the water. So I went to go buy a tranche of that and I started thinking to myself like, wait a second, I keep hearing about all this debt ceiling talk. Um, so let's educate you on what that is and why it's important. So this video is going to be called the debt ceiling crisis of 2023. This is about higher interest rates and more government spending. So what is the debt ceiling? So the debt ceiling is the legal limit on the amount of money the U.S. can borrow. So if you look at this chart over here, this is from uh, FRED. This is the U.S. Department of Treasury Fiscal Service, uh, basically the Federal Reserve's reporting. Um, so you can see here, since just before 1970, all the way to, I want to say, 2022 or 2023, these are in millions of dollars. So we're talking four million millions, okay? Okay. So you can see right around 2000 after the dot-com bubble, uh, federal debt, um, total public debt, absolutely uh, hockey-sticked and skyrocketed. So before the debt ceiling was created in 1917, Congress had free reign to spend. So the idea of this debt ceiling uh, is, the way, is basically the way to keep government fiscally responsible, um, which is pretty funny. So it's basically the legal amount that the United States government can borrow to finance its operations and fulfill its obligations. Uh, so this was established by Congress and essentially caps the total amount of money the government can borrow uh, from the public and from itself. So the government is fiscally responsible, right? Uh, LOL. <laughs> Yeah, right. Laugh out loud. So for anybody that goes into this kind of like politically heated, I mean, all the all the stats are here, you guys. It doesn't matter if you're red, blue, Coke, Pepsi, you know, AT&T or Verizon. Uh, it's all pretty much the same. So you can see here Republican and Democrat presidents. You can see the debt ceiling uh, right here in 2000. And then you can see the debt ceiling suspended right here. But since 1960, Congress has acted 78 times to permanently raise uh, temporarily extend or revise the definition of the debt ceiling, okay? 78 times. So both, both parties have contributed to this, 49 times under Republican presidents, 39 times under Democrat presidents. Uh, if you want to dig into this a little bit deeper, uh, just pause the slide here, but we have a lot of information, so I don't want to spend too, too much time on slides that you can just pause and look at yourself. So the debt ceiling was last raised in December of 2021. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys remember that. Uh, the U.S. reached this limit in January of 2023. So you can see here the black line is the U.S. statutory debt limit, and then yellow is the U.S. public debt uh, subject to limit, okay? So you can see that we basically met this right here. If you look at the x-axis, this January of 2023. These measures are a set of temporary actions that the Treasury can take to create additional headroom under the debt limit and continue meeting the government's financial obligations without violating the ceiling. Uh, these actions might include suspending the issuance of new debt or the reinvestment of matured securities in specific government funds, such as the Civil Service Retirement and Disability Fund, the Postal Service Retiree Health Benefits Fund, or the Government Securities Investment Fund, or the Federal Employees Retirement System. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So if we keep going, so what's happening right now? Okay, so a lot of this stuff is happening before June. That's why I wanted to get this video out before June. Uh, Yellen warns Congress Treasury may run out of cash soon as June. Okay, so we have these forecasts right here. Uh, on the left side right here, we have the firm. And then on the right side right here, we have the X date debt, uh, estimate. So what is happening is that they are temporarily halting the issuance of new debt or reinvestment in specific government funds, as we just mentioned in the previous slide. But this obviously can't go on forever. So we have JP Morgan here. They're saying the Treasury will exhaust all available resources to continue to avoid a technical default by June 9th. Bank of America, X date pulled forward consistent with Yellen's guidance due to Treasury's higher than expected financing needs and lower than expected remaining extraordinary measures. Uh, Wrights and ICAP and Barclays, you can pause the screen and read all this, but uh, we'll talk about dollar levels in the Treasury uh, most likely in the next slide. Uh, but the one I did want to read was the Treasury's resources will dip to around $50 billion and hover there between June 5th and June 14th 
after which the department should have enough breathing room to make it into late July. Okay, so here's the slide that I wanted to talk about. So the Treasury is running low on cash. So the cash balance turns lower again. You can see the Treasury's coffers have fallen b below $200 billion. Uh, the last time this happened was right around um, the last debt ceiling that we talked about. It was late 2021, early 2022, right around here. So you can see the black line is basically just showing you what the Treasury's total operating balance is. Uh, this top line right here is $1 trillion. Okay, that's a thousand billions. And then we have 0.5 and then we have zero on this bottom line right here. You can pause the screen and take a look at this further. So there's two sides of the argument. So we have uh, Republicans insisting on trillions in spending cuts and has vowed not to bring up a clean increase. Uh, meanwhile, it is clear that the only practical path to avoid default is for Congress to suspend the debt limit without conditions. This is the White House press secretary. So these are the past debt ceiling solutions. So uh, you can take a look at this chart over here. Uh, House, Senate, and White House schedules align on just seven days in May. Uh, you can see when Biden is available, this is a black circle. You can see when the Senate is available, it's like, kind of like a aqua green circle. You can see the orange circle is when the house is available and you can see the yellow highlighted um, dates are when a deal is possible. So this is a pretty good chart. And you can see that all those things align on the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 15th, 16th, and 17th. Um, that's May, okay, basically at the time of this recording. So Congress can modify the debt ceiling either by increasing the debt limit by a particular dollar amount or suspending the debt limit to a particular date. So from 2013 to 2021, the debt limit suspensions were more common. In 2021, Congress switched to the dollar amount increase modification due to concerns about the national debt. So what if the debt limit is not raised or suspended? What would happen here? So a failure to address the debt ceiling could result in a downgrade of U.S. credit ratings. So if you don't know what the rating agencies are, uh, three of the biggest players are S&P, Fitch, and Moody's. Uh, you can see here that the rating by credit agencies as of, this is a little bit older. This is March 2021, July 2020, and June 2020. Uh, you can see that S&P rated it uh, AA+, plus, Fitch AAA, Moody's AAA. So stable, negative, stable. There's different defini definitions for each ratings agency. You may want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, but basically, they assess the credit worthiness of governments and corporations, and a downgrade would signal to investors that the U.S. government poses a higher risk of default. So this chart goes from 1940 all the way to the projected date of 2033, uh, where you can see basically uh, 2030 right here where my laser pointer is. That would be right around here. Um, that is when they're going to exceed the previous high relative to the size of the economy. If you have a family, you know how much your loved ones depend on you. In a worst case scenario, you wouldn't want them to worry about money. A good life insurance plan can give you peace of mind that if something happens to you, your family will have a safety net to cover mortgage payments, college costs, or other expenses so they can get back on their feet and focus on what matters most. My wife and I personally use Policy Genius to find the right term insurance for ourselves and our family after our daughter was born. Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Their licensed agents work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have to have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees and your personal details are private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com slash whiteboard finance or click in the description below. There's a link to find your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. So moving on. So what if they're not raised or suspended? Uh, you can see here in the chart, fiscal year 2022 share of government outlays. Entitlement programs like Social Security and Medicare make up roughly a third of government spending. So at the top, we have Social Security, then we have Health, then we have Income Security, National Defense, Medicare, Education, Training, Employment, and Social Services, Net Interest, that's that purple line, that's the one we just talked about, uh, Veterans Benefits and Services, Transportation, General Government, and other. So if the debt limit is not raised, the amount of spending cuts or tax increases would equal $1.5 trillion just for this year, the amount uh, required. 
And again, this is coming from um, Bank of America Global Research. And then prioritizing net interest payments could come at the cost of cutting entitlement spending. So the bigger this purple column gets, the more screwed other things are. That's basically what it boils down to. Uh, think of it kind of like a person who, who had, who's in perpetual credit card debt and the annual percentage yield is higher than the amount that they can actually pay it off at. So other things have to suffer. Um, do you stop going out to eat? Do you drive you know, a, a less expensive car? Do you get rid of car payments? What do you do so you can service that debt? Well, other things have to get cut in your budget, right? So what could happen to the economy? Let's take a look at 2011. So uh, exhibit six right here, S&P 500. The 2011 fight over the debt ceiling led to a sharp drop in stock prices. So if you look at the S&P 500, that's just the blue line right here. Um, from February 2011 to August 2011, this goes all the way to February of 12, uh, 2012. You can see that August 2nd, the Budget Control Act was passed. So it, it, uh, drastically down, uh, down for a few months, down for a few months, and then it creeped back up in 2012. So in 2012, or excuse me, 2011, the debt ceiling crisis, the Treasury temporarily delayed all payments except for U.S. Treasury coupons, which technically prevented default. Despite this, U.S. government debt was downgraded and markets tanked until a resolution was passed. So what could happen to the economy? Uh, still going. Uh, consumer confidence measures, if you look at uh, August 2011 uh, being 100, uh, which is right around right here where my cursor is, uh, you can see consumer confidence was tanking, then it went up. Consumer sentiment kind of tanked, then it went up. And if you look at small business optimism, uh, it kind of tanked, and then it went up after there. So it's kind of just almost like fear-mongering. <laughs> Not fear-mongering, I mean, it's, it's just news. Um, but I think it's pretty important to note that, you know, a lot of stuff that you hear either on social media or on the news, it, it it's almost like... Um, a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It's like, oh, we're going into a recession. So everyone gets scared and then we cause a recession. I don't necessarily uh, believe that, obviously, but I think the uh, media and Twitter and things like that or social media are just like a megaphone, if you will. So what if the debt limit is not raised or suspended? So uh, if we take a look at this, look at this figure right here, you can see this uh, label right here is millions of jobs. Uh, you can see 2023, quarter three, 2023, quarter four, 2024 quarter one, this is basically a projection, 8 million jobs could be lost, okay? We see that right here. Uh, federal borrowing could surge by 750 billion over the next decade. An economic recession caused by a debt ceiling crisis gives the government limited tools since it can't necessarily stimulate the economy. So um, for the sake of time, you can pause this and take a look at this um, uh, chart right here. This is basically saying employment gains and losses under clean debt ceiling increase versus protracted default. Uh, and this is just projecting quarter three of 2023, you know, all the way through quarter one of 2024. So you can see the difference here. Clean debt ceiling increase, protracted default, and gray. So the bottom line is, is the system too broken to fix? So for the government, the solution to everything is obviously spend more money, print more money, and borrow more money. At what point does it fall apart? So if we look at the uh, total public debt as a percentage of GDP, uh, you can see that we're trying to do our best to um, lower that here. Then the dot-com bubble happens. It increases, 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 increases. Great financial crisis happens. Huge hockey stick. COVID or whatever this is, I'm assuming it's COVID because it's right before the gray recession line in 2020, skyrockets, and then we're coming back down. Now, if you look at M2 money supply, um, they kind of discontinued this metric technically, but it's still, the information's still out there. Uh, you can see that after the great financial crisis, this is basically just money, um, circula money in circulation, if you want to call it that. Um, some people just call it the money printer, but just for the sake of this video, just understand that this is money in the system. So you can see billions of dollars right here. Uh, you can see time on the bottom and then you know, it just basically skyrockets with COVID. And then we had quantitative tightening for a little bit, but we're trying to reverse all that. Okay. So getting into my thoughts, I don't have many thoughts on this. This has been happening all throughout history. You guys, I was actually cutting the grass over the weekend. I like cutting the grass. It's kind of like meditation for me. Um, and I re-listened to the creature from Jekyll Island. Uh, if you haven't read that book, go, uh, go listen to it or read it. It's basically just a history of the creation of the federal reserve. Um, and these headlines are no different. This happens all the time. You guys, whether it's uh, printing, uh, a, a trillion dollar coin or, you know, raising the debt ceiling or whatever it is, 
all these headlines, they just keep repeating themselves time and time again. And once you get old enough, I'd say, you know, 30 or older, 40 or older, you'll start to notice this pattern, okay? And that's kind of what I'm noticing. When I was listening to this book, this was, this was talked about multiple times throughout history, raising the debt ceiling. Uh, it just the number goes from 700 billion, 800 billion to now it's a trillion. And then 10 years from now, it's going to be 1.3 trillion. It's, um, it's so predictable at this point that, you know, I really don't have much to say about it. I just feel like it's a game of musical chairs and it's going to keep going until it ultimately stops. Um, it's kind of like duck, duck, goose or, you know, musical chairs, if you will. There's not going to be enough chairs uh, to sit on when there's too many players outside the game or outside the ring of the game. So at the end of the day, um, I don't want to come off as like too jaded or whatever, but I just feel like it's going to be business as usual, which it has been for a long time uh, until it isn't anymore. Um, so again, always look at alternative investments. I know I say this a lot, but um, you just may want to look at other things that are not directly correlated um, to equities or the financial markets, which is a lot. I mean, even real estate is, um, you know, stocks obviously are, you know, derivatives, bonds, options, all that stuff. Um, take a look at some uh, tangible stuff, maybe land, I don't know, uh, farmland. I know this sounds crazy, especially if you're just some random person in a suburb, you know, watching this video, but uh, you may want to start looking at some more self-sufficient ways to invest. It could be a small to medium business. Uh, it could be yourself through education. It could be a garden. It could be land. It could be a bunch of different things. Um, always, always think of your net worth as a diversified pie. You don't want to have all of your pie tied to one financial market or one financial system. Um, because at the end of the day, you don't know what's going to happen, right? So it's good to be diversified. Some people say diversification is diversification. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, and then also the basics, which I always go to, are, you know, get out of consumer debt. You don't want to be beholden to anyone. Um, with these debt ceiling increases, you're just basically going to print more money, which is going to devalue the currency ultimately. So debt, good debt, low interest rate debt on a tangible asset, maybe like your house, if you have a 2.5, 3.5% mortgage, 30-year fixed, inflation could actually be a good thing because it inflates away that debt. For me, I just don't like debt. I'm debt averse in my personal life, um, not necessarily in business or you know investment-wise, but personally, I don't have any debt. My wife and I are debt-free completely. Um, and that's why I'm able to sleep well at night. Uh, the one thing I'll leave you with in this video is sleep cheap. Okay. Thank you so much and have a prosperous day. Mm -hmm.